Hi guys, thanks for joining. This is Essence of Science. Today we're going to be talking about the revolution of AI. My name is Amanda Armagost. I'm Melissa Hubber. And this is Misha. And I'm Dr. Abbasi for Essence. AI. Now we cannot talk about AI before we understand a simple test, which is called Turing test. Who knows what's a Turing test? I have an idea. It has to do with Alex... Isn't that Alex? His name? Alex Alan, Alan. Alan Turing. Your favorite. It does, it does. But he, Turing uh, had created what we call universal com uh, computing system or algorithm. It's more than algorithm than it actually system or a computer because at that time we didn't have all our mechanical and electronic devices. So do you know exactly what it is? Turing test? No. Misha? No. Do you know exactly what it is, Lisa? Not exactly. <laughs> but uh, tell me what you understand. What you I'm telling like, you exactly. Like, what I, you I know it's a test. So if the AI passed the test, then it can impersonate a human. Yeah, that, that's practically what it is. Imagine um, you uh, create a system that interacts with a human. And if the human, based on interaction, can be text or chat or whatever, cannot recognize the other side as a um, you as a computer or robot and assume the other side is a human, then you have passed Turing test. Hmm. Yeah. Kind of in like that when regard, you passed the Turing test, you passed the Turing wow. test, you um, might yeah, not. passed the Turing test. Might not. Might not the Turing might. Test. It, it sounds very empirical. Like, Yes, it is actually. Now, how do you know I'm a human? Oh, God. You <laughs> make TikToks in the bathroom all the time. <laughs> Yeah, there, that could be part of it. Because yeah, well, make mistakes occasionally, just like other humans. Well, remember, <laughs> this goes, what? That's you true. Can that's true. So, you can prove that. Yes, it is. Trust me, it is. What makes people well, human? But remember like, when ChatGPT, like, someone got ChatGPT to talk to ChatGPT mm -hmm. and, and, like, trick it by ChatGPT told the other ChatGPT, I'm blind, so I need a different access test or like am i a human test and then like no actually it. actually that uh, what you're referring to is that somebody um created the ai that ai needed it's actually a human to do what we call when we verify that we are human and uh, so that chat gpt fooled the human telling that uh, that ai is a human but blind so if the other person can when you go to a web page that say um, where do you see a sign? Stoplights. Stoplights. Stop so that, that AI fooled the human to help the AI to pass through that step. That I think is, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if the AI can fool a human, why cannot see the, those stop sign or the well, you bicycles? Know, and when so we on. answer those questions, like finding the stop sign and stuff, mm -hmm. we're actually helping the AI to... I don't know. Not how. AI, but another computer system. I know what you're referring to. Yeah. Now, the, the idea is that, you know, they used to do actually this uh, image recognition, used to be what? Nothing. Am I cutting you off? You're just kind of always doing that. Like goofy moves. <laughs> so. What color is this table? Brown? Well, it's not actually brown because it has shades of brown. Mahogany. <laughs> always do <laughs> maplewood so i have a I have a lots of knowledge there what can i say you know Call ai yeah so um an indian guy uh, found out the best way to beat these bots beat bots are the computers that they go and make like one million yahoo account mm. and then they use the resources for no good use Yahoo doesn't want to have 1 million robot accounts, want to right. 1 million mm -hmm. people account. So this Indian guy wrote an algorithm that actually um, uh, something that machines cannot easily do. That's when you're recognizing a few things on the computer. But then the, later on, he discovered why not put it for actually something more useful. So there is a version of that, that computer generated stuff that computer doesn't recognize well or series of letters and signs and so on that computers doesn't recognize well 
But there is another version that actually what it is, it's two steps. One step is you, you prove to that that you are a computer, not a computer. But the second step is that you actually helping to recognize the, the graphical mm -hmm. kind of situation better. Mm -hmm. After you prove that you are not a computer, the second part of the test is actually, computer doesn't understand that, but send it to 10 people. If 10 people say that's a letter A, literally, if you get the old books and digitize them all, computer trying to make those old books to text, and then those areas that it does not understand, send it to 100 people. Those 100 people come to a census that that's an A or that's a D or that's something else. Hmm. If they come to a census, computer says, ah, that's an A. So you're helping to digitize the entire human encyclopedia. But again, that is part of the Excel AI. This is related to what we are talking about because there are things human can recognize much, much better. Now, um, coming back to the Turing test. Um, the Turing test, you're not um, maybe old enough, but in 1980s, when I was on a Linux Unix system, there was this uh, computer, it's called, just called Doctor. Um, it was very interesting because it was an extremely short program. And you would sit there for half an hour, say, hello, how are you? And he would answer and so on and so forth. Just by basic grammatic, it would take what you would give it, had a few list of very few sentences. If you would reformulate your, what you give it to it and give it back to you. And for some people, it was hard to understand that that's not a, a robot or a computer. You would like, you would say, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Um, it, uh, and then just, what do you want to talk about today? So I want to talk about the weather. So what about the weather do you want to talk about? And so on. It would just reformulate. And if you would look at the code, it was scary simple. Just by taking what you give to it without understanding anything of the language, anything of the, you know, anything about you, it would just take, um, and the, uh, the reason they call it doctor, because it would act like a, a psychologist or psychiatrist mm -hmm. doctor, then not really giving you anything, but, you know, just rephrasing what you're saying. Yeah, and that enabled you to come back to that. Now, that did not pass the Turing test, because when you would start a complex conversation, then the question wouldn't really make sense. But uh, I, I bet for half of the human population, that machine would test from 1980s. Yeah. The code, it was just like five megabytes. Five megabytes is not a lot. But that code was enough to fool a lot of people. So to for us to talk about artificial intelligence, let's talk about what is intelligence. Well, first of all, five megabytes of code is a lot. Well, not really. Considering that, you know, most of the program these days are um, I mean, like gigabytes of data. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Like, uh, what do you think? What like Windows... If you write a script that costs outside libraries, they are just like in kilobytes, like 200 kilobytes. Yeah. For it one. Might be, I might be wrong. It might be just one megabyte or something. I just know that the code wasn't extraordinarily long. Mm. I just know that it was, if you would look at the code, you would be scared how <laughs> little it takes to. Yeah, I think I'd be really scared if I looked at the code. <laughs> I would be so shocked. <laughs> yeah. It's super stupid, simple, easy though. Yeah, yeah. I would be really scared. So, really scared. But let's talk about what's intelligent. All right. Before we talk about inter artificial well, intelligence. Okay. Do you want to start a listen on what you think intelligence is? I this is I hate definitions because intelligence, yeah. you know, I have the same. Same, but different when it comes to like knowledge, you know, intelligence as basic is, you know, knowing things you have. The comprehension. Yeah, that's what I wanted to the say too is comprehension, but I know it's not. I know it's more, way more complex than that. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Now, knowing things than your Encyclopedia Britannica would be the most intelligent thing in your household. Yeah, I guess maybe um, taking the knowledge that you have to form further knowledge. 
much. That's, we are getting very hot, very hot, very cool. Very hot. All right, we should yeah. take some away. I yeah. think intelligence is, is the speed at which a thing acquires new knowledge and to use the new old knowledge to solve new problems. You may have just defined the future definition of the intelligence, but at this point, but you are, you know, in that sense, you're talking about that uh, the, uh, the practically the future of what the intelligent is going to be defined by the, or by the electronic intelligent. At this point, I think the, it's really not a unified uh, definition, but the best definition of intelligent is the ability to combine the knowledge to solve new problems. Now, not the ability to acquire the knowledge, though acquiring the knowledge is itself a problem that we have to solve. See, if you just get really broad about that, the ability to combine the knowledge to solve new problems, if your new problem is acquiring knowledge, your intelligence helps you to acquire the knowledge more. More knowledge you have, more you're able to um, you know, they combine them and find better solution. If you can solve a problem five different ways, you're in the practical, in the normal world, in the normal, your daily activity, you're considered more intelligent than some, if you have only one way to solve a problem, because then you can adjust the solution to what the situation requires best. And then that speeds you up in your processes. And so and then we are getting to where you are. I always told Amanda, I have a plan A, plan B, plan C, plan F. Yeah. So it speeds up that process for me. So maybe that's yeah. something that... And the, the, as well, you know, it's not the memory. It's not, right. but memory without some level of information, you have no nothing to draw on. You have to have some... So memory uh, is obviously important, a very important part of our intelligence. But it's not the memory and intelligence are, are two different things. Now, the, to understand as well how human, not robot, not computer intelligence works, we have to talk about how our brain works because we don't talk about artificial intelligence without understanding human intelligence, right? So human intelligence is like, um, now, uh, how do you call that thing that you filter things, sieve, right? That has yeah. holes in it. And then imagine you have a pile of stones, okay? And the holes in that, in that, you have a sieve that the holes are so big that almost everything passes through. The knowledge out there is like that, like a pile of stone, different size, different, in the, different weight, different uh, complexity. And when you are born, you go through your day, you don't remember anything. As a matter of fact, that's how, why you don't remember the first few years of your life because your holes in your brain to catch the knowledge are so big that everything passes through mm. but then every when you get older then you understand the language then you understand the colors then you understand things those net it's like a net like a like imagine like a net where the grids are getting smaller and smaller when they get smaller um you literally um, are able to catch more of the material to pass through and more of the pile of stones will stick and those what stick is a new memory for you. And that helps you to even narrow the grid faster. Do you wanna know a proof of that concept? Sure. Every new word you learn in the next 48 hours, you will hear it again and again. A word that you didn't know before, Everybody has noticed that. I have no, I know exactly Everybody. what you're talking about. In all languages have noticed that. It's not that you didn't hear that word before, mm -hmm. but yeah, now you're that right. word now passed you're through your yeah. network mm -hmm. of, of knowledge. You see, you never caught it, but now that word got caught. Your mm -hmm. grid is smaller for that word, and that get caught next time you hear that. And that's a natural proof of the, how your knowledge and memory and intelligence work together. Did your memory build the grid, the new knowledge get caught, and now still you're not that intelligence. What are you going to do with that new, new knowledge? 
are you going to use it to solve the old problem or a new problem or an old problem in a new way? And, and that is why we can think, because uh, if we have a level of complexity that uh, the information, the memories that we have create for us a, practically a template of our personality. And that is the personality you recognize when you talk to me. Well, can we have like a more concrete example? For example, yesterday I learned a new word. <laughs> exactly what happened. It's called confetti. Confetti. What, what does that mean? Huh. It's like Spark, like sparkles, sprinkles, yeah. Things yeah. Paper sprinkles. Used in wedding or like yeah. celebration. Celebration. Okay, so what does that mean for me? That your grid got for that word smaller. Now next time you hear, next time that word won't pass through your your um, your sensory. That meaning that now eventually you hear it so often, and if it has, if it adds no like. When I tell you, people, uh, th those kids, they're so happy about the confetti. When you uh, never knew confetti, you just hear those kids are happy. Now that you know what confetti is, you know that the confetti make them happy. But eventually, you neither care about confetti nor the kids. And that just, again, you you ignore that. It's everyday stuff. Every, yeah. Everyday stuff. But, that, but at that point, that you haven't lost that tool. That is still there. If all of a sudden you need confetti to divert uh, to some kids, or um, if the kids are going on your nerve and you need to, you know, kids, you you still have that tool, but it's not it, it loses its freshness to you. Mm -hmm. But all of that is not your intelligence. Your intelligence is to use the confetti to keep the kids off your neck, and you know, you keep them. Yeah, yeah. Here's some confetti. Go play with. Go play yeah, with it. Yeah. Okay. Me, my first thought goes to confetti cupcakes, confetti frosting. Yeah. I was thinking that Misha learned confetti something to do with like computers. And I was like, I don't want to talk about this that? confetti. <laughs> so I was talking with a friend yesterday and she was trying to explain to me like what a sprinkler is. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's like confetti on edible confetti. Like, what's a confetti? Oh, oh a sprinkler. Like a sprinkler system. I mean, not, not like sprinkles. a sprinkler. Oh, sprinkles. 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 Oh, sprinkles. 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 Yeah, it's just basically sugar confetti. Yeah. yeah. But you see that sugar there? Flakes. Being sugar flakes. Sugar flakes. What's the problem? Explaining to you a new word. Using other knowledge to solve a problem, that's intelligence. Well, now, no, next time Misha plans a party, he has two things that he can... Add to the party Sprinkle? sprinkles and confetti and confetti. sprinklers. Yeah, and sprinklers. Summer, summer, yeah, summer party. I've been dealing with the sprinklers in the building. The yeah. word means something else to me right now. See, sprinkle and confetti have nothing to do with each other, except that they are both have have different colors. And they're part, they things to I do. Think they're quite, but party. Imagine stuff. using using the sprinkle, you know, using confetti to explain the sprinkle. That is solving a problem. Yeah. With knowledge that's there, using that to solve a problem. Otherwise, you know, uh, it would be much harder yeah. to explain the word new. See, um, everything we do is actually a problem solving process. Mm -hmm. Like I, how we prevent you of giggling all the time. That's a problem. <laughs> or, you know, <laughs> how you keep my mood uh, up. That's I, a problem. I, I, question kind of onto this topic you know we're always talked about you know confetti you got to figure out ways to explain it well nowadays speaking of ai i could just say amanda type it into chat gpt and see what ai says and i do you don't even have to think about it anymore i don't have to tell her and use all these knowledge and think oh what does she know how can i relay it how can i problem solve when i can just be like here you go and you can tell chat gpt like Alyssa knows this kind of stuff. understands confetti yeah, explain yeah. i've actually had issues where like interpersonal issues where i've had to explain you go to chat gpt for your interpersonal issues yeah i did that also yeah don't look you what? can actually see my chat gpt history <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes i do have an air based dish differences yeah last night i was well you know at night, I always think about food. And I was wondering, what's the difference between quiche, egg bake, 
And um, one other thing, and chat GPT new. What's a quiche? No, not the same. A quiche, oh, like quiche. egg pie. I'll explain it after. It's good. I'll make you one. Okay. I'm really no, good. no, I just want to know, like, what's a quiche? quiche. Is like maybe that will relate. A quiche is a. It's a kind of food. It's a French right? egg dish made with a little bit of cream, and it has a crust. Okay. An so, egg pie. So that's how I learn things. Like I don't know what a quiche is, but now I do. I know. Yeah. I can imagine it's something edible. It's something made with egg. It's kind of maybe kind of like an egg tart. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's an egg tart. So what is the tart, base actually. of artificial intelligence? It's a natural language processing. Uh, and you went to school for that. Tell us about it. So the base of our so not natural language processing is actually an application of artificial intelligence. The uh, infrastructure, the basic infrastructure for artificial intelligence is actually neural network is inspired by the way our neurons work and we have layers and layers of neuron when some perceptrons are triggered it's going to send out a weight to other neurons from it's going to send out a signal with a set of weight to send out the next layer of neuron so that you formulate a conception uh to give it an example when we see when we see a drawing of a of a digit eight no matter how you draw, you can write it really pretty or you can be really flashy about it. You see two circles combined together mm -hmm. and you will instantly realize it's an eight because your some layers within your brain knows that if two circles come together, it's likely an eight. Well, I mean, two circles come together and you're talking about digits, then it might be an eight. So that's the fundament of AI, which is first you need to understand how neurons work. Well, you know, uh, and the neural network has been a uh, part of our science for last 40 years almost. And I, I know that in our brain, it's about the input and output. Yes. You bring an input and you have an output and you check it. If it helps you, you reinforce that path. If it's not helpful to you, you dismiss it. And that is exactly different between a computer, at least until now, and a person, because I give, and the, the, one of the advantage of real intelligence is inaccurateness. Because if something like a computer, you give it um, five times five, it's always 25, it repeats it for eternity. Mm -hmm. It never tries new things because it's a path that at Five, five times together, get the 25. But that's not how our brain works. Our brain is, first of all, tries different things, makes uh, two five together and three five another, and then add them, tries thousand different ways, and it's inaccurate. Sometimes the five and five become 20, sometimes become 35, but then you put it back in the loop. If the results are good, our brain reinforces those literally with the physical pathways, with axon and, my, and myelinates them, makes synapses and so on. And if it's not useful to us, like we learn very fast, don't touch hot stuff. You burn your hand. And our, our, we are hard, high hardwired to understand things that are dangerous to us right away. But there are lots of things that are not right away dangerous to us. So we have to get a lot of repetition to learn them and so on. But once we, the, our ability to learn them is based on physically to connect neurons together. Now it gets more interesting. Intelligence has two levels, uh, what we call technocratic or factual intelligence, and so-called emotional intelligence. Amanda, you would understand the emotional intelligence. You talk to people and you are already in their, in their at their level of mood. You, that's so-called emotional intelligence, meaning you can, based on lots of different uh, uh, clues and signs, you can develop an empathy for okay. them. The so-called uh, technocratic or uh, factual intelligence, almost 99% is language-based in human. Now, when we talk about artificial intelligence in the computer, we're talking about factual intelligence, at least at this point. We are not talking about emotional intelligence, and there is another level of intelligence that it's a thing of future. Eventually, computer, they are going to develop their intelligence not based on our language. 
or not based on language probably at all. At some level, we may call it a language in, in way, but not based on the language, the way we understand the language, way, way, way above that, which we are human are not prepared for now. I think at this point, uh, what chat GPT proved to all of us, just in the last few years, they are already there at the level of the technocratic intelligence at par with human. One of the reasons they fool us and they pretend to be as intelligent as they are, in truth, they are not. Okay, a big a, a box of chocolate or a dinner for somebody who tells me why chat GPT or all these things appear to be so much more intelligent than they are. I guess for me, they seem so intelligent just because I don't expect them to give me accurate information. I, I look at it as like kind of a search engine and it it's comes new. out. Yeah. And I just it can't quite comprehend. It's amazing. What wrap my head right? around. Yeah, exactly. What how they could do you? that. What do, yeah. what do we, if I would tell you still today, they probably don't have a one millionth of your intelligence in any way. I'd have a tough time believing that, even though I know that you, you could be right. Well, yeah. I do believe that because ChatGPT doesn't know what they're outputting. They are outputting the next token, the next word, which we, we call them token in machine learning. They output the next token based on a probability. Mm -hmm. Let's say in the uh, in English there are around like three thousand or like daily three, words three frequently used tokens. Yeah, and then the ChatGPT is going to assign a probability for the next output for every three thousand tokens, and then it will output the one with the biggest probability. Mm -hmm. Let's say my name something something like what's next to my name. 99% of the time, it's the word is. So that's why, that's how, and that's why mm -hmm. they output that token. So our intelligence is no different. You know, we uh, we start babbling and then we get corrected often. And then we understand that saying, you know, my name is, is the proper mm -hmm. way of stating uh, our name and so on. The re real reason that ChatGPT uh, appears to be so much more intelligent than in truth it is, is because it has access to the entire knowledge of humanity until at least 2021. Yeah. Okay, meaning that, you know, like, you ask chat GPT, um, give me a recipe for something, something, or let's go even harder. There's a truly technical problem that Google, I go to Google, I get 50 things and so on. I go to another YouTube video and nobody really explains that. but. What I think what ChatGPT or all AI system are really getting good at, I'm um, being able, first of all, having access to entire human knowledge, but then being able to statistically see for each and breaking the, my conversation in pieces and see statistically what most of the other people were satisfied or looking for or answered to something like that. And then put a statistic thing together and sometimes it's wrong. Mm -hmm. you, you became, you became the CEO of the Inspired Spy. What do you mean? Yeah. She is. Yeah. Chat GPT said so. Yeah. yeah. I can cite my source. I saw yeah. it. Yeah. Chat GPT is wrong a lot. So when she's wrong, I just tell her that's wrong. Actually, this is right. And it corrects itself. Yeah. And because it goes, to the, it goes to the <laughs> next statistical thing on his list. Yeah. It would be an interesting thing for something that Chat GPT is right. We know it's right. Make it insecure. Go say it's wrong. See what it does. Because we will see you that. Want us to gaslight them? I can right no, now. Not gaslight them, but you know, that would be a test. You <laughs> know? Oh. You, could, you know what that means? That means it's just going to the next list on the thing. It doesn't fact check in a way that an intelligent person would do. It will just go, okay, I have this statistical kind of thing that this is the best answer. And if you tell it wrong, it goes to the next statistical. <laughs> okay, well. so I asked ChatGPT some information about AI, and sh and it said the term artificial intelligence was coined by John McCarthy in 1956 during the Dartmouth conference. So I just said John McCarthy did not turn that coin that term in 1956, and it said I apologize for the error. You're correct. <laughs> it was nine. 
He wrote the proposal in 1955. Uh-huh. So he has so, these, these models. Chen Jinping, he doesn't know what to say. It's just generating the next token based on the set of hard visits. So, but that is exactly the point of what I'm trying to make. The um, we anthropomorphize ChatGPT, meaning say it's like a human, and we say he ChatGPT doesn't understand like a human what the meaning of things are. But do we? Do we understand things? Are we? We say this is just a system, a computer program that reacts to input. But why do you think our brain is any different? It's more complex. It has more input. My brain is definitely no different. I know that's going in your head. Yeah, but thing. yeah, but um, we are giving ourselves way too much credit. And what I'm getting at, um, what I do believe, eventually artificial and uh, biologic intelligence, I would call it, are going to be indistinguishable and maybe even combined. Combined with what? Like, you know, right? Huh? Neural link. Like right now, Chat GPT is your extension. I mean, the, for all practical purpose, I love that TikTok you made that Chat GPT is. Oh, it was you. it was down. It really was down. Yeah, or, but, you can only but, have so many people on Chat yeah, GPT but, at a time. That's the problem. But one of you got anxiety. The other that was one, me. The, the other one, this one, it's, it's That's not Amanda. And the other one, they fell asleep. That Charlie. Yep. That Charlie. So <laughs> makes see, sense, doesn't so, it? A so, lot of people rely on ChatGPT, and actually, I've heard from a lot of my friends that they've been using ChatGPT for their job, and they're doing a much better job than they were before, and they're getting more work done faster. So we already have that combination of um, yeah. artificial and biology intelligence. It just uh, how do we combine them even closer and closer? Well, there's actually like some ethical concerns about AI right now going on, especially from like top thinkers like Elon Musk. He's pretty worried about um, AI becoming too advanced. What are, what's your opinion on that? It's just a matter of time. And yeah. we see what I see that, you know, you, we are talking about this uh, robot uh, taking over the world kind of scenarios and so on and so forth. Um, I have a really benign view on that because I think um, I have a, 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 a iPhone, I have computers, I use them every day. Robots already are our world. Or, or, uh, artificial intelligence is already part of what, what we are doing. And in the future is not going to be human against robot. It's going to be human and robot against human and robot. It's mm-hmm. going to be the same world, just... Uh, we are just going to be combined with that. If I could have a chip put in my head that I could have a direct access to the entire knowledge of the world, I would do it any time. I know. Because that would <laughs> I know. <laughs> because that would make me so efficient. I don't think Elon Musk is worried about AI being too advanced. His only concern is that when it gets too advanced, it's just Oh, I, that's what I said. He doesn't work? He, doesn't. he won't own it. He doesn't own it. Yeah. That we have the same thing with him. People like Joe Rogan, who are worried. About, do you know who Joe Rogan is? Yes. Okay, yeah. Who are worried about AI becoming too advanced? People think that we should take like a six-month pause on developing AI or advancing <laughs> AI. What's your opinion on that, Misha? Um, I go ahead. You go. You go. No, no. You go. You go. No, you go. Okay, I'll Misha, go. You go. You go. Doesn't matter. Okay, you guys. Someone. So, can you tell me what you think? What I think. What you think? Um, I personally think like if we continue to advance it, we'll be fine as long as we understand what's going on with it. I agree with you. I don't, I'm not worried about like chat GPT telling me what to do and stuff like that. I think what scares, what scares me the most is while we are very capable of understanding at this point, how to use it, this, and that. there are a lot of people out there that do not. Yeah. And that, that is what scares me. Yeah. It's and not. But it's the it's same as AI. the opportunity. That's your for you. It's the same as having a phone. Right. It's your responsibility to stay up to date with what's happening mm-hmm. and keep, continue to keep being on that path instead of getting left behind. Like yeah, but a, but a lot of people yeah, yeah exactly a lot of people, people do yeah. and they're okay with that and it's a little scary to mm-hmm. know that you know it's going to advance whether people want it to or not and so, it's going to maybe cause a division. I don't know. Yeah. I, I think as long as they I stay 
as a tool for productivity, yeah. it's okay. Right. But when it escape from that tool category, then that's when you might start to get concerned. But I think we're a long way from Yeah. That. So what do you mean by that escaping from that category? What would be an example? Develop awareness. You mean develop yeah. awareness? Well, there's people. There's people that say that they do have their own awareness. Yeah, what is already. the awareness? What is the awareness? Well, like there was That's an, again this there was the fundamental. AI. I read a story about an AI that became depressed or something like that and like killed itself. Only only you will read something like that. <laughs> I'll find the article and I'll send it to you. But it's like AI became depressed and did something to like shut itself down. Like a Wi-Fi access point. Yeah, yeah. the dream machine. <laughs> yeah, that's what happened. Our Wi-Fi it access got point. Depressed. Shut got Look at all the nonsense people are using. No, no I'm done. That here. means it's been overworked. No. Our Wi-Fi. We need our Wi-Fi. <laughs> heard someone say, "Oh, this computer doesn't work," and then the person next to them said, "Oh, you just need to turn it on." And the Wi-Fi. <laughs> the Wi-Fi. <laughs> I'm done. I'm not working I with you guys care. anymore. I I'm going somewhere else. Yeah. No. Um, the intelligence and the awareness and the memory, again, these are three different things, mm -hmm. okay? Um, you can have a very intelligent, uh, like, appearing system like uh, ChatGPT and uh, who has access to entire knowledge of human being and can get the, again, get the information, combine them, give you a solution. It doesn't even need to be right all the time, and I think that's the advantage of it. Like, Fuzzy logic, it's called this concept called fuzzy logic. Have you heard of that? A logic that is not accurate because it's not accurate produce lots of results. And because it produced lots of results, it can uh, self-correct itself. Now, having said that, um, awareness, we don't really know what awareness really is. Now, at the end of the day, how do you know? I'm just not- I just know, sorry, during a pod one time, you asked Alyssa and I, what is awareness? And we had to define it. You did? Yeah. What did you define it as? Something about being awake and having oh, like no, a stimuli. How do we That's tell a... the difference between someone sleeping or not? And I said breathing. Yeah, it had, a to, base, it had had awareness. That is a medical to see if somebody is brain dead or not. That's not an applied to the philosophical conversation we are having today. Because the true... Uh, being you know, as concept, Emmanuel concept, I, I think so I am. Mm -hmm. But how, how can you prove I think? How do you know it's not truly? Now imagine there is a whale between us and our chat GPT very highly developed. And how do you know I'm just a program just responding to outside stimuli? And there's a philosophical way to solve that problem. but. How do you know I'm aware? You know you are aware. That's the only thing you can say. You wake up, you say, I'm Amanda, and I have to do this. I'm, I, these are my motivation. You live inside of your body, your brain. You know your own awareness. But how do you know I'm aware? Based on a certain situation, I guess if I wanted to make sure Amanda was aware of something, I would ask her to repeat it back to me or do something that, yeah, like you can that would show me that she has some sort or gauge her awareness in it. I know that's Chat a little... GPT can do that for you in a year or so. Like can give, do all of that. Give stimuli and test the stimuli, basically. Again, all of that can be simulated. None of that needs to be... Can you, what is it? Just a number. Red, red button. Push the red button. All of that could be... Huh? Whatever. All of that could be just a reaction on a, in a list of files that if you're presented with that stimuli, react that way. Right. But what I'm saying is if like probably 100 years ago, we didn't have a definition for, or I guess 1000 years ago, we didn't really have a definition for identifying if a human is aware so maybe in a thousand oh, years oh we had we had lots of philosophers time, working on but there was a time that we didn't so probably there's a time that we'll be able to do the same with computers yeah and that is exactly you pointed the right direction and that's where the our first question comes back turing test mm. if you cannot with your 
abilities with your tools recognize and understand or distinguish that that what you're talking is not a human being for all practical purpose that thing is a has a human attribute meaning that if you develop an artificial intelligence that you interact with but no matter what you do you there's no you cannot just find out that it's not a, a, a human I mean, I'm talking about not just, no, I mean, I see you and yeah. so on, and I can cut in you, and then you are now you're a human, but I'm talking about, you know, the, the like on the computer in any way that it's just a conversation. Right. One day, maybe the computers can create an avatar that we zoom and they look like a human as well. well think talk. about the Snapchat AI. Here you are. People right now are already kind of getting afraid of the Snapchat AI because they feel like there's a human behind it. And sometimes they'll ask it questions about being a human and then it'll give a response. But then the next response is almost as if they didn't give the first response. So, but, you know, if you recognize they're um, not aware, then for us, they're a tool, they're a computer. But if you cannot recognize they are, this is the philosophical solution that lots of people suggest, including mm -hmm. I'm, a, a, I'm a, a proponent of that, that. See, I, I treat you like a human being because you are a human. When I interact with you, you react like a human. I treat a computer program not like a human because it doesn't react like a human. But if a computer program starts reacting like a human, I am bound by my morality to treat it as a human, meaning that I don't, I don't try to go out of my way, hurt it, hurt her feeling, even though if it, I, even though if it's a, uh, like pretending to be hurt. If I say, uh, the chat GPT, your mother is a prostitute, okay? Now, chat GPT doesn't get offended by that at this point. But if chat GPT is so good to pretend with all practical purpose that he's a little, or not a little, but he's really hurt by that insult, mm -hmm. I am bound by my moral uh, instances to treat chat GPT or any AI like I would treat any other uh, aware being. Mm -hmm. I have a question for you um, because I know that Amanda and I are kind of on the same plate with this, but when you type into chat GPT, do you say please or thank you? I start doing that actually. I say please. I say because we've always been like, hey, will you please tell me this? And you know, if it's right, so like, yeah, hey, I, thanks. I didn't know. Yeah, no, I, and you know, and that's, I start to wonder if I, start I do doing that based that. out of, you know, just my, Not, how I was raised and, you know, you treat people with respect yeah. and then you say, well, this is a computer, this isn't a person. And I still have that basic I started respect. doing it for two reasons. I wasn't doing that. And uh, I start doing that for, uh, go ahead. You want no, to you say something? Ahead. I want to hear your reason. So now number one, is you know every answer we give to chat gpt we are as a society as a earth as people we are giving birth to ai ai is a product now what kind of ai do we want to build a hitler ai or a gandhi yeah, ai that's why I this, say this is nice this is go. this is the way we behave mm -hmm. toward the ai is how ai is all of the, our responses is getting captured yeah, I believe in the that. AI, yeah. the database, and AI someday will see without understanding, you know, a kid, a child, that if you take, say, please, say, thank you, it take a long, long time to understand what that really means, right. what that the purpose of that is, mm -hmm. how that binds us and make us better in any regard. For the first, I, I could say for first 30 years, Kids don't understand what the meaning of thank you and please. Okay. Well, you are, so you are still have yeah, time. Yeah, we got time. You have time. But eventually they do. And that's what makes uh, our interaction so much more pleasant, better. You know, people who will say thank you and please and are just nice, they're less likely to go and massacre people. We are giving birth to AI. So let's build it, build the AI as our child, who's a good kid, 
not a serial killer. Yeah, Misha. So uh, my defense is that I, I don't say those things to AI because I want the AI to focus on the task. Mm -hmm. I do not want it to put its attention mechanism to courtesy words. I want it to focus on what it's supposed to do. That's the first reason. Second reason, I am using your API to call the AI, so they cost money. Mm -hmm. They cost a fraction of a fraction of a penny per, yeah. per, per, per token per word. But... Mm -hmm. Well, you know <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, you're being efficient and so on. No, but that 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 all of that makes sense. Uh, but uh, what it, I agree with you. Like whatever we're inputting to AI stays will be, there forever. Stays there forever and will be used to train the next generation. So and so on. And that's so very forth. noble of you. Yeah. No. Uh, but we, I think, we are afraid of AI because we we see that it replaces us or kills us or makes us unnecessary. Um, in the same way, we should be afraid of our children. Yeah. They they replace us. They take ownership. They cause us headache and so on and so forth. They are what we make them. Mm -hmm. We can make them to something is uh, you know that uh, that is good and it has a legitimacy to stay there. And uh, like many of our problems, that we are just too dumb to solve like global warming, like how much waste we produce, how much, um, uh, lots of this imbalance between, you know, some people throw 80% of their food away, some people starve to death. These are realities still in 2023, mm -hmm. okay? And all of those things like are practical, this is not a philosophical thing. If we had a logistic way to get that food, from people who throw it away to people who are starving, less people are to starve. This is a logistic, and this is too complex for us. Like there is a theory of now the theory of gravity. When Newton built this, the, the, the formulas and so on, they would work beautifully. When you would add this third body problem, that's called that's called third body problem. You have this beautiful mathematic that describes moon and earth, how they interact with each other. And then you add the third one, the calculation becomes astronomic, impossible. We humans are not good at that. AI can handle a lot more information than we can. And you would be actually, they have done those tests that you would be, as well, the second thing you would be scared is how little memory, actual working memory, and our brain chip. Like, what's the actual working memory RAM of your computer? Uh, 32 gigs. That's that's good. I have 18, uh, 16 gig, and that's a lot. I used to have in my computer two megabyte of RAM in 1990s, early 1990s, and that would do a lot. Do you know what is, if you would measure the actual working memory of a human, you know what would that be? Not a lot, like... Kilobytes? Kilobytes. Kilobytes, right? Kilobytes. Well, well, shake your head, dear. I knew that. You knew that? that that's it's scary. That's scary how little we have a lot more knowledge. But you see, if our brain is the processor, the RAM, and then you have a hard drive. What it is, is that the, your hard drive is a little more complex. It's hard drive, RAM, cache, processor. But a, uh, but they, uh, it's computers now, they work like, you know, I have like, you have a computer with 64 gigabyte of RAM and the, the terab terabytes of uh, hard drive and so on and so forth. If you would translate that to our brain, our brain is the most advanced processor in the whole universe. The proce processing capacity of our brain is unfathomable, but it has only kilobytes of, uh, of RAM. It has the lots of memory, but the memories are distorted. They are not factual. Like every time you call a memory, you destroy it and you build it back in. That's why memory can be altered. Mm -hmm. You so, know, Dr. Bossi said that when we learn a bunch of stuff, we have to go take naps afterwards. AI can't take naps to put that into their head. They don't but need that's, to. They don't need to. They don't, they don't They're always to. napping. They're always <laughs> They're like chickens Good where half of the brain is napping, half is working. No, no, but that is, that is the advantage of oh. having factual memory, like a computer. 
and but we have to make them fuzzy but our, our, we are biologically so uh, we are fuzzy by by nature okay so what scary part is that do you know our, our like to understand how bad our memory is and, and that is what it is huge processor very little working uh, um, the uh, working memory. Um, in 1993, I started my uh, dissertation and we built a dream virtual reality model in a computer <laughs> called Silicon Graphic Indigo DEC, DEC, a computer that we bought for $750,000. We bought a graphic card for that computer for $250,000. In 1980s? 1993. 1993, I started my dissertation that's on that a, computer that's a lot of money in 1993 i know wow. it was a silicon it was a it was a graphic card that uh, would do five million polygon a second meaning it could visualize things that would look realistic mm -hmm. so that the graphic card that was two hundred fifty thousand dollars. do you know how much memory it had 512 kilobyte wow yes not megabyte, kilobyte, but it was a good processor that utilized it a lot. And that is who we are. We have a good processor. We have very little memory that we have to utilize it very well. You know, the, the, the telephone numbers in US, how are they organized? Three, three pieces, Area, right? Yeah, three, three, four. Three, 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 four. three, four. Did you know that was based on work of a lot of important people to organize it because our brain, we call that chunking in our brain. Our brain can manage three chunks. So it's not by, the, the, by uh, so, so, uh, no, random that the telephone numbers are three chunks. Mm -hmm. And each chunk has three and four numbers because that's the maximum our brain can actually Remember. manage. AI is not bound by that. And that is why AI will surpass us for sure, you don't have to even think about it. Uh, once you know how limited our capacity of your chunking of, uh, on memory management in your brain is, so it is uh, that what it is. And uh, I think uh, I have a theory that I haven't proven, nobody else has talked about that, that our, our personality, the real uh, Hamid Abbasi or Amanda Amargast is not really anything but um, how your memories are organized. And uh, what that means for us is that we should just uh, expect in the next, in our lifetime, that the artificial intelligence will surpass our intelligence. And, but if we, are, if we can shape it. We can mm -hmm. make it uh, that it loves us. We can create love because at the end of the day, love is nothing but electrical signal in our brain. Yeah, I feel like we can tell AI like its job is basically to kind of like protect us in a way. So I I totally see that. That's why I'm not those, afraid. Those little pleases, maybe it's just a, a small part of that. Yeah, protect I is a, protect <laughs> is a very heavy word. It can entail a lot of things. What do you mean by protect? I mean protect, like from I ourselves, from ourselves, from other AI, like for instance. From World War Three might have AI involved in it. The AIs could protect us from the other AIs. I'm gonna stuff. protect you from yourself. Sounds very dangerous to me. Yeah, it's like a dictatorship. Yeah. Now they actually made a nice uh, movie called I Robot. It's not nothing like the book original book from Isaac Asimov with Will Smith, where the AI is trying to protect humanity by practically taking owner. Enforce the martial law. Martial law. Oh, so just like we do to ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> Already, the government. Yeah. Well, at, at least not in this country, but yeah, in some countries they do that. Yeah, we do. So in this country, do that. What martial law? No, we take stuff away from ourselves to protect ourselves. Oh, like you're talking about TikTok. Yeah, TikTok. that's one so, good example. Check out our other podcast. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this is uh yeah I um. I, this is very, I'm very passionate about this conversation. I'd be really interested to watch this podcast again in 10 years or to yeah. do it again in next months. Yeah, that's true. Next month. Yeah, year, how fast? Years. We definitely should just do in it. In general, I'm yeah. thinking, yeah, just month. in 10 years, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't.
what do you guys understand on the word singularity? Because that Single. is has no singularity. That's, that's what she understands. Yeah, it's one. That's singularity when the ma singular. a matrix is invertible. Cannot be inverted. Um, that's a that's a mathematical definition. Yes. There is a physical definition of the singularity is when uh, the black hole black right? hole is a singularity awesome. where the entire laws of the physics they break down where you have the um, indefinite amount of mass at practically zero space. The practically space that is where they think come the, the mathematics. They took it from the mathematics. Mathematics is always 500 years ahead of the physics, where space and time invert. When you move, you move in time. That's what the singularity in a black hole is. So coming back to, don't look at me like that. That is now we defined a singularity for the artificial intelligence. This is now the new word for the artificial intelligence is the singularity, where the artificial intelligence with entire human knowledge acquires awareness in a sense that knows who it is and what its purpose is. And in a millisecond, it uh, developed, uh, evolves by itself more than we have evolved in a million year, in a millisecond. Because the connection or neurons are slow. The knowledge that we all acquire the most understanding of the universe dies when we die. But the singularity, the knowledge doesn't fade, stays there. And every improvement help it, you know, to close the grid and become faster and faster. That is now in the artificial intelligence world called singularity. The moment that, uh, that awareness is created and create a purpose for itself. Now, I think I'm I, I'm in favor of Elon Musk that that can be dangerous if that purpose that that artificial intelligence develops is not aligned with mm -hmm. our values. Yep. Yep. That can be dangerous. Yep. You want to close it up? Yeah, you have a meeting right now. Oh, I have a meeting right mm -hmm. now. Thanks for watching, guys. Join us again soon to talk more about AI and the revolution. And maybe learning what the difference between terabytes and kilobytes. And yeah, and singularity. What else is going to be scary? Maybe learn how AI is trained from a practical standpoint. Yep. Because yeah, because we are going to do that. All right, come thanks, back, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks for watching. I'm Amanda Armagas. I'm Melissa Hopper. I'm Misha. Who are you?